Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. The Marines wrap up operations in southern Afghanistan, soon to be heading home. Also tonight, they may look like sweet treats, but read the labels carefully. Law enforcement warning about candies and snacks laced with marijuana. Plus, Kevin Faulkner joins us for an update on everything from the Charger Stadium to the upcoming election. I'm Peggy Pico with that conversation. And a veteran police captain in La Mesa helps police officers here and across the country deal with PTSD. How first responders are responding to his wellness program. And San Diego honors one of its finest lost in the line of duty. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. The last U.S. Marines have left southern Afghanistan. They flew out today, a move signaling the end of the Corps' combat mission. They will complete their deployment at Kandahar Airfield. Afghan forces will now take over those facilities. The Marines are leaving behind in Helmand province. At one point, more than 20,000 Marines were fighting the Taliban there. A small army base remains in Helmand. U.S. has an agreement to keep nearly 10,000 troops in Afghanistan to help Afghan forces and run counter-terrorism counter operations. California National Guard has received the military's first ever award for innovation in stopping sexual assaults. The Guard's being honored for a series of steps to prevent assaults, help victims, and take action against perpetrators. Those uh, steps include a full-time assault investigator, and more than 100 victim advocates statewide. There's a new report tonight about drug use among people arrested in San Diego County showing higher rates of marijuana and methamphetamine use. Now, the report comes from the San Diego Association of Governments, or SANDAG. It finds more than two-thirds of the people arrested last year tested positive for an illegal substance. There were also increases in men testing positive for marijuana and meth. Sandag researchers say the numbers are the highest since the drug monitoring program began. Sheriff's Department is warning people to look out for packages like this in their children's Halloween bags. They look like regular candy, but look closer. These are actually laced with medical marijuana. Deputies want to keep these candies away from kids because it can make them sick. A psychiatrist says a man accused of killing three San Diegans last year is not competent to stand trial. Prosecutors now have to decide if they'll seek a trial to determine whether Carlo Mercado is capable of understanding the charges against him. Mercado is accused of killing Ilona Flint and Salvatore Belvedere at a Mission Valley Mall on Christmas Eve. He's also accused of killing Gianni Belvedere, whose body was found in Riverside in January. Prosecutors have not released a motive. A San Diego police officer slain during a 2010 shootout was honored in the neighborhood. He served for 17 years, an area all too familiar with police confrontations. Officer Christopher Wilson worked the Southeastern Division where a park monument was dedicated in his honor. Police officers in many ways are like sheepdogs, protecting the flock of sheep from the wolves. Is there anything more noble? Kaylee Wilson remembering one of her late father's favorite quotes. She shared a poem she wrote shortly after Christopher Wilson died four years ago, assisting in a joint raid at an apartment complex when officers were met with a hail of gunfire. Because of him, I will go on and do my best to make him proud, wishing at every milestone I could see his face watching me from the crowd. A hero was taken too soon, but there is nothing we can do except honor a man who changed the world and help each other just like he would do. Former San Diego police officer turned city council member Myrtle Cole says Wilson was dedicated to the community and made the ultimate sacrifice. As a former police lieutenant, I know the sacrifices that our men and women in blue make every single day. We owe them a debt that we can never repay. Cole's office covered the cost of a permanent memorial in her district, renaming Skyview Park right next door to the Southeastern Division headquarters, Christopher Wilson Memorial Park. In the neighborhood, he served for 17 years. Police Chief Shelley Zimmerman. 
You know, parks are about communities. So when the communities come here, the families, particularly the children that come here, let this park be a beacon of hope and opportunity because that's what Chris would have wanted for them. Scores of officers and public officials attended today's dedication. Officer Wilson is survived by his wife and two kids. SeaWorld is caring for a sea lion found with a fisherman's gaff hooked to its back. Now, the animal was rescued Sunday at La Jolla Cove. It had to be sedated so rescuers could actually remove the hook and 10-foot-long pole. It's not clear how the sea lion got hurt. Folks at SeaWorld say they hope to release him back to the ocean in the next week or so. Tonight, federal regulators are holding a public meeting in Carlsbad on a plan to decommission the San Onofre nuclear plant in North County. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is considering how to store the plant's nuclear waste. As the tight race between Congressman Scott Peters and GOP challenger Carl DeMaio enters the final stretch of campaigning, San Diego airwaves have been bombarded with negative ads paid for by outside spending groups with lots of money. News Source reporter Joe Yarardi has been following the money, and he joins us from the newsroom. So, Joe, let's start with the big picture. How much have these outside packs spent on the race? Well, up until September 15th, hardly any of these outside spending groups had launched ads directed at either DeMaio or Peters. Since September 15th, we've seen nearly $5.4 million in spending by these groups. That averaged out to nearly $150,000 every day. Now, I need to mention that that figure doesn't include money spent on so-called issue ads, political advertisements that don't expressly advocate for or against the re-election of a candidate and that don't have to be reported to the FEC. So how much do those uh, figures compare with what the DeMaio and Peters campaigns have spent? Between September 15th and October 15th, these outside groups spent nearly two and a half times as much as the two campaigns spent combined. One expert I spoke with said that's a common occurrence in close races like this one. One reason is that regulations require TV stations to offer candidates the lowest possible rate for their ads. Stations are under no such obligation when outside groups come looking for airtime, so they've got to spend more money to air the same number of ads as candidates. However, many of these groups are super PACs that can accept unlimited contributions from individuals, businesses, unions, etc., while candidates must abide by strict fundraising limits, so they just won't have the same amount of money to spend as these outside groups. And remind us, Joe, what have these uh, groups been spending all that dough on? ads, specifically negative ads. About 90 percent of the spending these groups have reported has been identified as money spent to oppose a candidate. The reason? Negative advertising works. It gets your supporters riled up, demoralizes your opponents likely voters, and drums out undecided independence. It's usually viewed as a pretty good strategy. Well, we'll see how it all works out in just over a week. I news source reporter Joe Urardi. Thanks. The upcoming election was one of the subjects San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner discussed today with Peggy Pico. Mayor Kevin Faulkner, welcome back. Good to be back. Thank you, Peggy. Now, Republican Chris Kate and Democrat uh, Carol Kim are running against each other for a city council seat in District 6, which represents Claremont, uh, parts of Kearney Mesa to Rancho Penasquitos, just below Highway 56. If Kate wins, Democrats lose their supermajority uh, on the council. How will that impact your job? Well, you know, I'm a strong supporter of Chris Kate um, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, I, I think Chris has not only the experience, but he's a big believer in the reforms that and I think most San Diegans want, which is continuing to make sure we're running efficiently at City Hall and, and doing the right thing. So I look at it less from a partisan standpoint and more of we need to have somebody in that seat that understands how important it is to get the city back on track, economically speaking. It's going to be fighting for our working families. And, and also, as I said before, really sticking to the reforms that we've spent the last five, seven years pushing uh, and voters have supported. So the supermajority doesn't really, it, it's not that big of a deal to you? I think every issue is going to be different. And, you know, I've, since I've been elected, I've tried to set the tone that um, you treat people with respect and with dignity. It doesn't matter about party affiliation, but it matters all about are we moving this city in the right direction. Uh, I think Chris will be a, a great addition to the council, and I, and I hope he uh, 
he, he wins here coming up to just about uh, one week, I guess. Well, uh, former yeah. city council uh, member uh, Carl DeMaio, back in May, you endorsed him for the 52nd con congressional seat. Since then, one of his campaign staffers, as you know, has accused him of sexual harassment. Um, do you stand by your endorsement? And if you do, why? I did endorse Carl a year ago. He has my uh, endorsement. And I know there's been a lot of back and forth, certainly in that race. Uh, but I am spending most of my time on the District 6 City Council race, which we just talked about. I think that has a direct impact, obviously, of a lot of reforms that I'm pushing on in the city. Uh, and really, my vision of, of bringing the city together is, is one San Diego in all neighborhoods. And, and I think Chris Cade is going to do a great job. Well, moving on to the police department, I know they are actually getting a compensation survey that's supposed to be due out at the end of this month in just a few days. Um, what can you tell us about it? Where does it stand now? Uh, we have a real issue when it comes to police officer recruitment and retention. That's one of the reasons in the budget that I, I put forward that we increase the number of recruits in our academies from 34 to 43 in each one. Um, the worst thing that we can do is to spend uh, a lot of hard-earned tax dollars hiring these great men and women, uh, joining our department, and then they leave for other departments. Uh, so I commissioned this salary survey to see where we are so we have a benchmark. Um, but regardless of, of what that survey is going to come out with, and I know it's going to show us low, we have to change that. And we have to make sure that we're competitive, that we're keeping these men and women. Um, and it's too important uh, for us to make sure that they're staying on our police force and we give them the resources to do that. Would you be willing to pay them more? Absolutely. And one of the things that we're going to be looking at is compensation. Um, you know, we got to look at what our neighbors are doing in, in other cities. We have to look at what our sheriff's department is doing, which is one of the biggest draws. Uh, I'm going to ensure that this police department is competitive and that our men and women have a very clear path as to how they can be successful. Now, I know that you pushed for the city's uh, mandatory water restrictions, which go into effect this weekend. Um, how long do you anticipate that these mandatory restrictions will uh, have to last? Uh, we're not sure how long they're going to last. Obviously, uh, we've been here before as a city uh, during our last drought. And in fact, you know, as you look at, uh, it's really been a way of life for a lot of San Diegans. Um, we'll get through this one again. Uh, it's hard to predict <laughs> how much it's going to rain and when, uh, but it's all about making sure we're doing the right thing, uh, you know, from our, particularly from outdoor landscaping and watering, um, and, to, and to keep us on that path. You know, I, I will say San Diegans have done a great job. We just need to keep it up. And, uh, and uh, speaking of that path, you actually uh, announced uh, this this app for yeah. water wasters, and there's also a hotline. How will the city respond to people calling in and saying, "Look, uh, my residence or, or someplace else I see is a water waster"? Yeah, the, the idea is, you know, you're driving. Let's say you're driving by a city park, and you see, oh, this, you know, this is, sprinkler's broken. It's just pouring water out. There's an app that you can go on, and in real time, you know, send it right. It goes right away to the city department, and we can get somebody out there to fix it. Um, it's all about using technology to be smarter uh, so you don't have to go home. What is the phone number I should call the water department? Um, and I think it's going to get a great response. Now we've only got uh, just a little time left, so I want to end on this. Are you moving forward with plans for a, a downtown Chargers stadium? And if so, how would that be funded? Keeping the Chargers is important in San Diego. Uh, and I'm less concerned about where a stadium may or may not go, but more concerned about any financing plan has to protect us as taxpayers. Uh, and so that will be the, the basis on which we come to that decision. Voters will have a final say in approval. Um, I think we can do this as a city. You know, it's going to take a lot of work for us to get everybody to the table. But as I look, for example, the work we did on Petco Park, uh, it was an open process. Voters supported it. I think we have the same opportunity to do that with the Chargers. All right. Well, we'll certainly be following this and yeah. looking forward to hearing from Thank you more on this. You. Mayor Kevin Faulkner. Thank you. Thank you. Judges have enormous power over people's lives. They can send you to jail. They can impose multi-million dollar fines. But how should judges be held accountable? Should voters have a say? KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma says a campaign for an open judicial seat in the county has reignited the discussion in legal circles. If opponents of electing judges were arguing in court, they might use the case of Ken Gosselin to make their point. Gosselin is a lawyer who wants to be a judge on the San Diego Superior Court. Earlier this year, he told voters he was a Harvard-trained attorney. Gosselin actually earned his law degree from Laverne University. Gosselin also stated he was a constitutional lawyer, when in fact, his specialty is real estate. Gosselin claimed in his candidate statement he had presided over thousands of criminal and civil 
civil cases as a volunteer judge, but volunteer judges like Goslin are limited to traffic and small claims cases. Goslin did not respond in time to comment for this story, but in the past he has called these issues misunderstandings. And then there's the issue of Gosselin's campaign signs. In the months before the June primary to the casual onlooker, Gosselin's signs portrayed him as an incumbent judge, which he is not. I mean, that's outrageous. Howard Weiner is a retired justice from the California Court of Appeal. That's the kind of abuse that is, you know, one's blood boils. I mean, that shouldn't happen. That's simply wrong. California Western School of Law Professor Glenn Smith says abuse is a consequence of allowing people to run for judge. When you have judicial candidates appealing directly to voters, um, you, you have the risk that all of the problems with you know, other elections will come into play. Problems like false or misleading claims, negative advertising, and fundraising. Lawyers and well-heeled companies with potential cases before judges up for re-election may feel compelled to contribute. Smith says it's a cycle that undermines the impartiality of courts. The idea is people don't get favorable treatment because they were a big contributor or because they're a certain party or whatever they should get equal justice. So we really expect judges, when we, when we make them run for election, we expect them to do a lot, to be unbiased and not uh, respond to political you know, incentives and political favors, etc. Um, but yet put them in this process. The process can also trigger a challenge to an incumbent judge based on a single decision that angers someone. In 1994, that happened to Judge Anthony Joseph, who is now retired. I had a case that involved the Boy Scouts and one of their troop leaders, and he was a gay, and the Boy Scouts were disciplining him, and I found that that was inappropriate inappropriate and not legal. So I drew a candidate um, based on that decision. And it's not fun to be run against. Joseph went on to defeat his challenger. Retired Justice Weiner calls judicial elections imperfect but necessary to throw out bad judges or at least rehabilitate them. It's a wonderful opportunity to learn about what he or she may have done incorrectly to improve. Now, if a judge has the personality, I've done nothing wrong, they're picking on me, etc. you know, it's been a waste of time. Maybe that judge should lose if the candidate is a better qualified candidate. Weiner says the elections also serve to temper the arrogance that can come from too much time on the bench. I haven't seen increasing humility uh, over the years when one is a judge. I mean, when you grade your own papers for a long time and people stand up when you walk in the room and they laugh at your jokes all the time, uh, you know, it, it's easy to think you're pretty smart and pretty important. The San Diego County Bar Association rates candidates for judge. The group has weighed in on the only contested judicial election next month. Candidate Gosselin was deemed lacking in qualifications. His opponent, Deputy State Attorney General Brad Weinreb, was rated qualified. Amitha Sharma, KPBS News. You can find all of our election coverage and a link to our online voter guide at kpbs.org slash election. From stocks to gas prices, they are still dropping around the county. Today's average for self-serve regular is $3.00. 41 cents a gallon, the lowest in about three and a half years here. GasBuddy.com says the cheapest gas right now is up in the North County. Stations in San Marcos and Escondido charging $2.99. Most expensive gas is in the South Bay, $4.29 at a station in National City. A state agency providing earthquake insurance wants to lower its rates. The California Earthquake Authority provides about 75% of residential earthquake insurance in the state, but only about 10% of California homeowners have earthquake policies. Lower rates could entice more people to buy the insurance. If the State Department of Insurance approves the plan, the lower rates could take effect in 2016. First responders are trained to deal with violence and disasters, but the emotional anguish can have long-lasting effects on them. Peggy Pico explains how a local police chief is helping. 
Chilling research from Harvard University finds public mass shootings like Friday's high school shooting in Washington state are happening more often than in decades past. The aftermath of these types of tragedies include the personal toll on first responders and their families. My guest, La Mesa Police Captain Dan Willis, tackles this issue in his new book, Bulletproof Spirit. Captain Willis, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Now, you're a 25-year police veteran. Was there a particular case uh, during this time that, that made you realize that your job was affecting you uh, emotionally and mentally and or your family? There was. After being on the job for about seven or eight years, I was right in the middle of working a very brutal homicide case. A man got taken up to the city of Compton and had his head and hands severed. And I worked that case for five years, pretty much nonstop. And during that process, I was immersed in this world of drug dealers and pimps and, and prostitutes. And I really began to lose a part of myself and became very consumed and almost overwhelmed by the job, which is really the, the inherent nature of police work. And if, if we're not careful, which has happened to so many of my colleagues, you really begin to suffer inside. Well, you said you didn't want to end up killing yourself. Um, how did you get better? Well, I, I noticed during this process that I really didn't have any feelings anymore. I wasn't connected with anybody, not connected or engaged with my wife, with my kids. I was indifferent to everybody and everything, and again, just consumed with the work. And I, I noticed that, man, this is not good, and it's not going to probably end in a good way unless I really take note of how am I going to emotionally survive this career. And is that how you came up with these uh, training sessions and these steps basically outlined in your book on, on how to get better? Yes, and, and it's a process. I've been a police officer now for almost 26 years, and it, it's a lot of what has worked for me and what I've seen in my colleagues to help really protect, heal, and nurture their spirit. Yeah, what, what sort of steps do you, do you talk about specifically, sort of some of the key factors in, in getting better? Well, the first thing that I like to talk about is officers really need to become more self-aware because if you're not aware how the job is negatively affecting you, you're not going to be able to do anything about it. So there's several warning signs. One, what I experienced, being emotionally dead inside. Uh, sleep disorders is a big one. Most officers only get four or five hours of sleep a night, and 40% have serious sleep disorders. Well, you also talk about uh, PTSD also, that, that from these traumas and repeated traumas that uh, first responders can do this. How do police departments actually handle, or do they address PTSD? Well, uh, n not only is suicide the number one cause of death for police, there's about 120,000 officers going to work every day in America with full symptoms of PTSD. So it, it's something that uh, when I first came on, it wasn't talked about at all. At least now, the conversation is, is more around about hey, the job really does very seriously affect you. You can develop symptoms of PTSD, but if you do, there are effective treatments for it to help you process it and move forward. Okay, specifically with police officers, these are the tough guys out there. Are they open to uh, asking for help for themselves or their families? They're getting more and more so. I mean, yeah, we're the tough guys, but um, you know, we really are human like everybody else. We suffer, we fear, and we bleed like everyone else. And we see things that nobody should really ever see and we see them over and over and over again over the life of a career and if, if the officers aren't trained how to do those proactive things for them to survive emotionally then that they're not going to be in a very good state how much do you think the public actually understands about uh, the stress that comes with being a first responder I really don't think the public really understands what we go through and, and I hope that the just the conscious awareness of what first responders go through um, becomes more well known because when when an officer comes out you have no idea uh, and you're upset because it took him so long to show up you don't know if he just held a baby in his arms and watched it die or whether he was in a fight for his life or, or what maybe he's had two hours of sleep every night for last week so uh, I just hope there's a little more understanding of what these officers are going through uh, and like I said we're human too and we need help now, you have a wellness program. You do wellness training uh, based on, on this book, and, and it's in the La Mesa Police Department. What effect right. has that had uh, in that department? Um, I think it's had a, a significant impact. Before, we've, had, we've lost many, many officers who got involved in shootings, who didn't know how to deal with critical incidents. And a couple years ago, once the program had been going for a while, the uh, entire squad ended up getting involved in a fatal shooting. One officer was very, very seriously um, hurt by that. 
and uh, we helped him out along the process and he credits what we've been able to do for him for not only saving his career but he also said I I probably wouldn't be here all right well we have a lot more information about this on our website kpbs.org police captain Dan Willis thank you very much thank you I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour among Ebola's many tolls the orphans the deadly virus leaves behind that's Monday on the PBS news hour Looks like we're going to close out the last few days of October with a bit of, war of a warm-up. We'll go from the mid to upper 70s along the coast over the next few days. Upper 70s to mid 80s for the inland valleys. Mountain temperatures will range from the low to mid 70s. And for the desert, just around 90 degrees. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.